So we all know about the mean ergodic theory, right? It's, it says that if you have a major presuming uh, system, then uh, you can look at the iterate uh, uh, of a function, then this average converges in the R2 sets. So um, uh, all the limits in this talk uh, will be assumed to take in the R2 sense. And uh, uh, if, the transform if the transformation is logodic, then we can say more about the limit, right? We know this limit, uh, which sometimes called to be the time average converge to the space average, which is the integral of the function. And actually this is not uh, one direction, it's a if and only if. Namely, uh, if you have a system where the space average always converts to the time average, then that's th that would imply that the key is ergodic. And uh, uh, in multiple ergodic uh, averages, we are interested in like more uh, complicated expressions. Like we could take the products of functions with different iterates. And um, uh, the, the well-known result of Hosan Kra in 2005 shows that this R2 limit exists. And this type of uh, limits are also related to uh, the like uh, summary type of problems, right? And also we can do things more complicated where instead of having a single transformation, I could have multiple transformations by which are uh, commuting with each other. So again, in this talk, uh, uh, if I don't say anything about the transformation, I assume that they commute with each other. So, um, and we could do things even more complicated where we could, at each term, we have products of transformations and the iterates, instead of having uh, linear iterates, we could have polynomial iterates. And uh, thanks to the uh, result of Walsh, we know that even the most complicated case, the R2 limit exists. So out of these limits, we know their existence. So the next question would be, uh, um, well, uh, what can we say about these limits? And in particular, uh, one interesting question would be, why will this, uh, let's call it to be the time average of multiple uh, 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 transformations converges to the space average? And uh, the, here, the best candidate for space average would be the products of the integrals of the functions, right? So one of the sample cases would be, let's look at this case. So one could formulate a question like this. So if I look at the, the products of different transformations with linear iterates, uh, under what condition can we ensure that this limit always converges to the prod product of the integral? And if we want to uh, reformulate this question a little bit, we could say that we, we look at the product transformation T1 cross T2 cross TD on the product system X to D. This question is the same as asking that why is this transformation ergodic with respect to the diagonal measure on this space? So this question was uh, studied in a paper of Baron and Burgos in 1984. They actually gives a necessary and sufficient characterization for this uh, property to be true. So they showed that the answer to this question is affirmative if and only if the, both of the following two conditions are satisfied. The first condition is that if you look at the difference between two transformations, it has to be a gothic for any different pairs i and j. Uh, the second uh, condition is that if you look at the product transformation, then it needs to be a gothic with respect to the product measure on xd. So the difference between the second condition and the, the problem itself is that one of them is with respect to the product measure and the other is with the diagonal measure. And uh, so uh, it's worth noting that the, so these two conditions, they are, uh, I would call them to be spectrum uh, conditions in the sense that if I know the, like all the eigenvalues uh, and, uh, of the system, then I could uh, check by hand whether both of these conditions are satisfied. Whereas this question itself, the original question, uh, uh, just, uh, just by knowing the spectrum condition for the, uh, for the system does not immediately give you an affirmative or negative answer to this question. So that's the difference between the product measure and the diagonal measure. Okay, and uh, uh, in order to uh, formulate our questions more conveniently, we will need to introduce some annotations. So in our setting, uh, when we say something is a ZD system, we mean a tuple like this, where X B mu is a probability space, and this T and this is a group, a CD group action of major presuming transformations acting on the space. And sometimes for convenient, uh, when writing a Z or ZD uh, system, 
we do not write the entire group here. So uh, sometimes we just write the generators. So if uh, a group is generated by T, we, we, we write a G system like this. And for GD system, instead of writing on the entire group, I write down the generators T1, T20, TD, and we still call them to be G or GD systems. Okay, and now uh, let us assume that I have some functions P1 to PK, which are maps from G to GD. And uh, we say that a sequence, uh, so, so this tuple of functions is jointly agotic with respect to the major mu or with respect to the system. Uh, it's the same thing. If for any error infinity function f1 to fk, I look at the average, the multiple agotic average with respect to the iterates p1n to pkn. So here we are, we are in a GD system. So the input is an integer, so the output is a d-dimensional vector. Uh, so this average will always convert to the product of the integral. If that's the case, we see that this tuple is jointly agotic for this system. So then uh, multi, uh, motivated by the result of Burgos and Berend, we could ask a more general question, namely, if I have a tuple of functions and I have a system, why is this tuple jointly agotic with respect to the given system? And uh, uh, so uh, based on the result of Berend and Bergson, we could make some natural conjectures on it. Uh, but in order to formulate the conjecture, I will need uh, one more uh, definition. So suppose I have a GD system and I have a sequence of d-dimensional vectors. I say that this sequence is a, it's an ergodic sequence with respect to the system. If whenever I have a function f and I look at the single uh, time average for f along this sequence a n, if this sequence always converges to the integral of f, then I will say that this sequence is an ergodic sequence. So one of the example is like, if we are in a Z system and the T is a Gothic transformation. So by the mean a Gothic theory, we know that T being a Gothic is equivalent of saying using this language, the, the, the entire sequence of integers is an a Gothic sequence for the measure. So, so here for convenience, we don't talk about a Gothicity for function, for transformations, but we talk about a Gothicity for sequences or sequences of transformations. Okay, and then inspired by the result of uh, Baron and Bergson, we could formulate the following uh, conjecture. Um, suppose I have some functions P1 to PK from Z to ZD. Um, let, let, let's say that they are polynomials. And then um, this tube of functions will be jointly agotic with respect to a ZD system if and only if the following two conditions are satisfied. The first condition is like you look at the difference of these polynomials, uh, and uh, this should be a, a gothic sequence with respect to the major mu. And the second is that you take the product of these transformations, which gives me a sequence of actions on the product system. Then this uh, sequence should be a, a gothic sequence with respect to the product measure. And again, here, the, these two conditions, as I mentioned, are spectrum conditions, whereas the joint logodicity is not a spectrum condition. So this is why that these two uh, conditions would simplify the, um, uh, uh, the problem on characterizing whether uh, a sequence of uh, functions are jointly logodic or not. So here are some uh, results that uh, uh, we know in this uh, problem. So the first result would be like uh, 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 Baron and Bergson. So they proved that for this sequence, uh, we have an affirmative answer for the joint logodicity conjecture. Yeah, by the way, so this problem, uh, I, I call it to be the joint logodicity uh, conjecture. And uh, uh, another interesting result was uh, uh, given by Bergson and Leibman. So they proved that uh, in this case, you have two uh, transformations with linear iterates, uh, just two of them. But what is interesting here is that here, uh, T1, T2 are not commuting with each other. They only require the T1, T2 to form a new potent group, but then they can verify that the, the, uh, the joint logodicity conjecture is also true in this case. There is a more recent result by Burgos and Lemma and so on. So they, they, what they can do is that instead of looking at a linear iterate, we can replace them with a bracket linear polynomials like alpha of i, times n, and then you take the integer part. 
and um, uh, and basically they proved that the um, the answer uh, to this question is also true for this uh, tuple. So these are the um, uh, examples that we have for linear like uh, iterates. And for nonlinear iterates, there was a uh, earlier work of uh, True and Zikinakis and Host in 2011. So they proved that if you have tuples like this, where the P1 to PD are polynomials of distinct degree, then in this case, uh, actually, uh, we, have, we also have an affirmative answer to this question. Well, actually, in uh, in their paper, they didn't do anything about uh, joint logodicity, so they didn't state this result explicitly. But actually, by using the mean technical results in their paper and uh, uh, together with some uh, very quick argument, uh, it's not very difficult to show that they, they, they essentially uh, were able to answer this question for this. Case. Okay, so these are the uh, known results uh, in um, uh, in literature. And in the last uh, few years, there has been some uh, progress in this uh, problem, which enables us to do even more general cases. Like the, uh, the result I'm going to talk in this talk would be uh, a joint work with uh, Sebastian Donoso and Andres uh, Kuzunasis. So we proved that uh, for the following tuple, uh, the joint logicity conjecture is satisfied. So here, what we have is that we could have T1 to the to a polynomial and then TT, TD to a polynomial power uh, where all the polynomials are the same. So one of the example would be, uh, so uh, we could prove T1 to the power of N square and then until TD to the power of N square, which is a result that was not covered in the previous slide. Well, um, so after this result, there are also some uh, further development in this uh, direction. So um, a few, uh, maybe a one, a one year later, uh, the three of us together with Andrew Ferry, we proved a slightly more general case than this case, but I'm not, not going to state this result because it's a little bit technical. And in that paper, we also improved uh, uh, some of the technical tools in, the, uh, in our original paper. So make, the, so make the argument like more, uh, uh, could. Uh, um, like more effective uh, in some sense. And uh, there was a very recent result by Francinakis and Kuka. So they were able to prove an even more general case where uh, they can show that if you have uh, polynomials, uh, P1 until PD, uh, which don't have to be the same polynomial, but they can show that the joint logodicity conjecture will be <coughs> satisfied uh, for this tuple. I think the bar in, in Boris talk in the uh, at the end of the, uh, this morning he will talk about this uh, 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 this uh, topic. And also uh, and there's another result by uh, Sebastian Andres and I which uh, shows that uh, so this P, so this uh, function p don't have to actually be a polynomial if p is a Hardy field function. Uh, as uh, as Tina uh, talked about Hardy field uh, yesterday, which are functions like uh, like n to the power of 1.5 or say n times log and this type of function. So we are also able to verify that joint logodicity conjecture is satisfied for this type of um, tuples. So in the next talk, uh, uh, in the next talk uh, Sebastian is going to talk about uh, some topics related to this project. And in this talk, uh, I'm uh, mainly go going to focus on this result and uh, um, I will basically talk about some of the, the new tools that was developed in this area that can help us to answer these questions. Okay, so to begin with, uh, I would like to take a revisit of the result of Barron and Bergson. So remember that they proved the joint logodicity conjecture for this linear iterates, right? So um, oh, uh, it's this result. So um, the result uh, of uh, Baron and Bergson was proved in 1980s. And we know that at that time, we do not have the big tools like the structure theorem since uh, things like this in a Gothic theory. And so, um, but uh, they managed to prove this result without using any modern tools in uh, dynamics. So here, the proof I'm going to present is, uh, is a different proof. And uh, this proof, we will use the structure theorems. But uh, here, uh, I hope that this gives you a feeling on uh, how we call them, 
how the structure theorems can be very useful in the study of uh, this type of uh, problems. So um, this is an if and only if condition, but one of the direction turns out to be not difficult, namely the only if condition. So to prove the only if condition, uh, 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 what we need to show is that if, if one of these two conditions is not satisfied, then I wanted to show that this tuple is not jointly ergodic. So if I first assume that the first condition is not satisfied, then that means I can find a non-constant function f such that t1 of f equals to t2 of f. Well, uh, if I have a function like this, then I can, uh, so this is a, a multiple ergodic average we are looking at, right? I will set all the functions starting from f3 to be the constant one function, and the first two functions to be the same function f here. Then what will this average become of? Because t1 f equals to t2 f. So this is the average of t1 of uh, f, uh, t1 f square. And then by using the, mm, yeah, and, and then by using the mean ergodic theory, uh, uh, by using the mean ergodic theory, we know that this one will converge to the square of the conditional expectation of f under the t1 invariant sigma algebra. But then because of the cauchy schwarz inequality, we know that this could never equal to the square of the integral unless f is a constant function. But here, as I mentioned, f is not a constant function in the beginning. So this means that the space average is not always convergent to the time average. So that um, I, I should, uh, the other way around, the time average do not always converge to the space average. So the so so this will be not jointly ergodic. So next we will need to show that if the second condition fails, then uh, uh, then it's not then the the tuple is not jointly ergodic. To do that is um, if the second condition fails, then I can find a non-constant function g, which is invariant under the product transformation t1 cross t2 cross td. Well, so here uh, we actually need to. Uh, make a little bit discussion here and uh, we need to use the spectral theorem a little bit uh, but uh, essentially uh, if you believe the, uh, believe me then this is essentially enables us to reduce to the case where g is of the form of tensors of functions f1 to fp well this step is not the entirely trivial but i omit some of the details here but the the thing is that you can assume that g takes this form and if that's the case, uh, if I substitute the f1, f2, and your fd given by the function g, then because of the invariance of the function g, the, the, the multiple ergodic average that we are looking at would be the constant, which is the product of the functions f1 to fd. And, um, but this function will, will not be the same as the integral of the functions, um, unless all the functions f1 to fd are constant functions but this would imply G is a constant function. So, so that means uh, if the second condition uh, fails, then the tuple is also not jointly ergodic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Oh, uh, so um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the last line, I'm not taking the uh, the average on the tensor product of f uh, uh, f one to f d. I'm taking the average along the products of f one to f d. Oh no! Uh, in the last uh, equality, I'm only using the fact that uh, this f one to f d are invariant under the transformation. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, um, um, yeah, so, 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 the, yeah, it is like the, the f1 times f2 times fd that you see there. This is not a function on x to the d, this is a function on x. This is the function f1x times f2x and you. Uh, uh, 
plus Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like yes, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so, 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 um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so basically, yeah, um, uh, um, uh, you indeed need to be uh, a little bit careful when passing from the product uh, measure to the diagonal measure. But in this case, actually, it, it, uh, um, uh, actually, it's easy to to pass there. So this is not the problematic part. Yeah. Yeah, but the um, um but the uh, the key point is that the only if but uh, like uh, after uh, um, uh, some uh, discussions, you have to be a little bit careful as uh, Vitaly mentioned, but uh, after some uh, careful work, you can show that this direction is not quite uh, difficult. And uh, basically the main part would be the if part. And in order to talk about the if part, I will need to introduce some of the notations regarding to the whole square seminoms and whole square measures, and, uh, uh, which we have heard a lot uh, in the last two days talks. But in our case, the definition is slightly different. So suppose we have a, a, a ZD system, X, B, mu, T, N, and uh, let us assume that G is a subgroup of ZD. Um, and then I use the notation IG to denote the sigma algebra, uh, sub sigma algebra of all the G invariant sets. And uh, whenever I have a sub sigma algebra D of, the, of B, then I can define the relatively independent product mu cross mu under D. So this is given by the formula that I mentioned there. So you look at the uh, the conditional expectation of the function f and g under that sigma algebra, and then you take the product. So this is the what we call the relatively independent product. And then we could use these uh, uh, concepts to define whole square measures inductively. So um, let us assume that I have, I have some groups g1, g2, and two gd, which are subgroups of zd. So the first measure mu g1 is defined to be the relatively independent product of mu cross mu under the g1 invariant sigma algebra. And then uh, I can do it inductively. And suppose I have defined the d minus one step uh, whole square measure. Then the next step is defined to be the self uh, uh, product of the previous step conditionally on the invariant and sigma algebra under gd delta. And what is this GD data here is that this is the diagonal group uh, generated by all the elements coming from GD. And the, uh, and the, 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 um, the dimension of the diagonal is uh, two to the power of D minus one. So inductively, this defines uh, uh, a sequence of measures uh, like mu G1 to GD on the uh, power space uh, X to the power of D to the two to the power of D. And then we could use these measures to define seminoms. So uh, for any function f, say it's an R infinity function, I can define the whole square seminom of f with respect to, to the groups g1 to gd to be the, the following one. So this is the integral of the, the tensor product of f uh, with itself for two to the power of d times where the measure that we put here is the whole square measure that I just defined on the previous slide. So the whole square seminom that I defined here uh, uh, is different from the one that you see in the, pre in the previous two uh, days in the sense that in the previous two days, um, what happens is that all the group G1 to GD, they equals to the, um, the largest group. So in our case, it, sh it should be like all these G1 to GD are the entire group GD. But in our case, at a different step, we could put a different uh, subgroup. So this is like in the dynamical cubes, it's like in the one direction, you can go with the group G1, but in the other direction, you can go with a different group G2. So it's like at different direction, you can go with different uh, groups. And uh, so this is the, what um, uh, uh, our seminar. And this type of seminar is very useful in providing an upper bound for multiple ergodic averages. For example, there is a result by a host, which shows that uh, for the uh, multiple ergodic average for linear e trace for commuting transformations, you can bound this thing by the whole square seminar of F1 with respect to the transformations that I listed there, these transformations. So this result is a direct application for the uh, 
when the COVID trick and together with the uh, unpacking the definition for the host graph seminal. Yeah, but uh, a, a bad thing about the, this type of uh, uh, factors is like, if the groups G1 to GD are different, then uh, in general, we don't have a very good structure theorem in the sense that uh, the structure part is not a, a, a new system or a function coming from new system. And uh, in this case, um, uh, there, was, uh, there are a, a few results by Austin and the host on this type of structure theorem, but we know that the structure is uh, very bad in general. But uh, in terms of the joint logodicity problems, uh, we can cheat a little bit here. Um, the reason is that it's given by the following corollary. Um, it turns out that if, if I know that all the uh, relevant uh, transformations in the, uh, in the uh, that defines the host graph seminal are ergodic, then we could uh, replace those transformations by the entire group GD. Then, so basically the color is that if we can, mm, if all the transformations T1 and T1 TJ inverse are ergodic, then I can bound the multiple uh, average by the conventional host graph seminal with the entire group GD. And for that group, we know that uh, nowadays um, we do have a good new new potent structure for that seminal. Okay, and uh, uh, so the next uh, uh, um, thing that uh, we need to talk about is that there is a recent uh, work with friends uh, of forensic Hinakis, which gives us a very nice criterion for jointly for characterizing when a sequence of functions are jointly ergodic. So uh, in, in Sina's talk uh, at the end of yesterday, uh, he also mentioned this result, but here we are talking about a, uh, a ZD version of it. So the ZD version was generalized by uh, Best and Ferry uh, uh, later. Um, uh, so it says that if I want to check a tuple P1 to PK is jointly ergodic, I only need to check two conditions. The first is called the good for seminal estimate condition. Namely, I wanted to show that the multiple ergodic average I'm looking at equals to zero, provided that uh, one the, the host cross seminum for any uh, of these functions uh, with respect to the group ZD, ZD, ZD equals to zero. So that's the good for seminum estimate, which essentially allows you to reduce the problem to the new potent case. And then the second condition is to say that you only you actually don't need to check the new potent case. You just need to check the rotation case. So the second is the good for equidistribution condition, where we need to check that uh, the uh, basically the the time average converges to the space average for all the functions which are measurable with respect to the largest rotation factor of x, or in other words, the Kronecker factor of x. So basically the second thing tells you that it's sufficient to verify uh, this result for rotation systems. So these are the two things we need to verify. So now let's go back to the result of Barrett and Bergson. So we, we are now ready to prove the if condition. So uh, so there's two conditions, right? One is the, the red condition and then there's a blue one. So I, I put them in colors so you can see it more clearly. Um, first of all, about the good for equity distribution condition. It turns out that the blue condition uh, would, uh, would always imply good for equity distribution. The reason is that uh, if we are in a rotation system, then uh, an orbit in a, rot in a, uh, in a torus, is, if it is equity distributed at one point, then it is the same as saying that it's equity distributed at every point. This is because of the homogeneity of the torus. Uh, if you move the, uh, uh, um, um, the initial point, you are not going to change the equity distribution properties. And, uh, and uh, that means for rotation systems, being uh, ergodic with respect to the product measure is really the same as being ergodic with the diagonal measure. So, the, so therefore for rotation systems, you get the joint ergodicity for free from the blue part. So that means uh, the, the blue condition gives us the good for equity distribution. And then what we want is the good for seminal uh, control um, uh, property. And uh, remember, uh, recall that uh, 
I talk that the um, uh, host gives us an inequality where I can bond the desired average by a host plus seminum like this. And then the next corollary says that if all the transformations that you see in the host cross seminum are ergodic, then I can replace the seminum bound by the by, by the uh, by the group by the CD uh, norm like CD 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 so on, and uh, this would be uh, so if this is the case, then we would have that uh, it's good for the seminum uh, um, uh, control. And uh, um, in in this case, uh, it turns out that. Uh, we indeed have that these transformations are ergodic. The reason comes from the right condition, um, because the right condition tells you that T1 uh, TJ inverse is ergodic. The ergodic the ergodicity of T1, though it's it, it doesn't quite follow from the right condition, but it is hidden implicitly from the blue condition, because the blue condition says that the product uh, sequence is ergodic. So that means that. If you restrict yourself to the first product, uh, first uh, coordinate is ergodic. So in particular, T1 is ergodic. So that means uh, we can apply this uh, corollary to show that it's also good for seminal control. So that means both of the conditions are satisfied. Um, and uh, this would imply that the sequence T1 to TDN is jointly ergodic. So this is a proof of uh, the result of Burgos and Barron uh, using the tools that's developed in the um, uh, in the recent years. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Pro probably there's a power there. Uh, and also uh, actually uh, in the more general polynomial case, what we are look uh, it actually so uh, we, what we have is a weaker version for it in the sense that we prove that if the left, the right hand side is zero, then this would imply the left hand side is zero. Like in the uh, here, it says if the if that seminal is zero, then we have this is zero. I see. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, for uh, for for the linear case, it's uh yeah, I think it's since um a, a nicer compared with the polynomial ones, early. Okay, so now uh so much for the uh result of Burgos and Berman, and um, let us look at uh, like um uh one example that for the new result, namely let us consider the tuple where the we still have t one to t d, but now the polynomial is n squared. And we wanted to verify the joint logodicity uh, uh, problem in this setting. And again, uh, the only if part of this uh, theorem is very similar to the philosophy that I mentioned before. So this part is relatively easy. Well, uh, indeed, you need some work uh, to, to deal with the spectrum of the system. But, uh, if, but if you trust me, this is not the difficult part. So, so now let's look at uh, the if part. Uh, for the if part, again, so we need to uh, verify two things. The first is good for equity distribution. Uh, for the good for equity distribution, this is very similar to the previous part that, that in the sense that this is guaranteed by the blue condition. This is again, because if you are in a rotation system, even for polynomial iterates, then being equity distribution with respect to the uh, diagonal measure is the same as being equity distribution for the uh, product measure. So the major difficulty is to verify the good for seminal estimate condition. Namely, I wanted to show that the average I'm looking at converges to zero uh, if the host cross seminal for, let's say, F1, with respect to certain ergodic transformations, S1 to SK equals to zero. And the conventional way that we want to find out our upper bound is to use the Van der Kolpert trick, which Sohail um, uh, uh, had a very uh, uh, a very good talk on the on this trick in the uh, on Monday. Uh, but one bad thing about the host the the, the Van der Kolpert trick is that the Van der Kolpert trick uh, works very nicely for linear iterates and also for polynomial iterates, but for single transformations, if you want to use directly the Van der Kolb trick for 
multiple transformations, you will uh, do not get uh, as nice estimate as we get before. Because if you look at the like the, the inequality of host, you can bound this uh, average by a single host per seminal, right? But if you try to do, do the same thing for the for our case, as you can see, the right hand side is not a single host cross seminal. So this is a triple average uh, for host cross seminals of F1, where the transformations that defines the host cross seminal, which I wrote by H, uh, SH1 until SH7, they are transformations that is dependent on the parameter capital H, which is uh, H1, H2, H3. And actually you can compute out these transformations, uh, S1, SH1 to SH7 explicitly. So they can be written like this. So here for, for convenience, I use the notation R to denote the, the transformation T1 times T2 inverse. As you can see, for example, if you look at SH, uh, SH3, let's say. So if you, for different choice of H1 and H2, this will be different vectors pointing to a random direction in the, Z2 space. So for different age, you will have different seminars. And uh, um, yeah, so the, yeah, so basically the difficulty here is that we don't really have a single whole square seminar estimate. And in, our, in order to overcome this difficulty, uh, what we use is a uh, work of Tor and Ziegler on concatenation theorem. So the theorem itself is a little bit uh, difficult to, <clears throat> uh, to state, but roughly speaking, it says that uh, if you wanted to uh, estimate the average of multiple host cross seminars, then you could, um, uh, this machine enables you to, uh, to add the groups in different uh, seminars together into a larger group. So, there are many different versions of concatenation theorem, and the, the one that we use here is the following one. So suppose I have a finite set of index, index uh, i, and for each index and each j from one to k, I have some subgroup uh, h, j, j, i. I wanted to look at the average of the whole square segment of, of f with respect to the h, y, i, and to h, k, i. And, and in order to show that this average equals to zero, it is sufficient to show the, the, the first line, namely I take a double average on I and I prime. And, uh, and uh, for, for each I and I prime, I look at a whole square seminum, but the groups given by the whole square seminum are the sums of those uh, HJI and HJ prime and the uh, I prime. So if I, I can prove that this uh, average is zero, then the target average uh, will be zero. So what's the difference is that the orange, in the original average, we have a k-step host cross seminal. Whereas uh, when you take a double sum, you have a, you have a, a host cross seminal of, of k-square steps. So you significantly increase the, the length, uh, the steps of the seminal. But, uh, but, but what, you, what, you, what you can gain from here is that uh, you are able to take the sums of the, uh, the subgroups and taking the sums usually would gives you a larger group. And uh, uh, if you have a larger group, it in the end you will actually end up with a better uh, structure uh, theorem. So this is uh, the, the use of it. Like one of the example would be let us consider the case where the the seven groups are given by the SH1 to SH7 that I defined there. Uh, if we use the concatenation theorem, for example, um, this would allow us to take the sum of different uh, groups. Say that if I take the sum of, let's say, SH3 and SH5, but possibly for different H, then what is it? So H3 is like you are pointing in one direction depending on H1 and uh, H2, but for S, uh, H5, you are pointing in a different direction. But generically, if you choose your H, these two H sufficiently uh, independent. This is like two vectors in Z2 in different directions. And the group generated by like the sum, if you take the sum of these groups, this is like a finite index subgroup of the entire uh, Z2, uh, 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 entire group Z2. Uh, um, and um, 
it is exactly because of this um, uh, reason. So if we if you start by adding the groups together, you will make the group larger and larger, and then uh, uh, you will get a better seminal estimate. So if we apply the concatenation theorem in our uh, 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 to our case, we would able to, to, to show that I can bond this uh, average uh, seminal by a single large seminal. And uh, the, the large seminal will have uh, 49 terms because uh, you have seven to the, uh, you have the square of seven. So this many terms. Uh, you have many groups here, but the good thing is that these groups, the G1 to G7 that I, uh, that I read there, there are only two possibilities, uh, three possibilities. The first is that it's a group generated by T1. Uh, well, it's a finite subgroup uh, of the group generated by T1. And the second is a group uh, uh, generated by R, which is the T1, T2 inverse. And finally, some of the groups will become very large. It is the group generated by T1 square and T2 square, which is a finite index subgroup for the G2, uh, G2 group. So therefore, uh, mm, uh, but on the other hand, so if uh, the, the, the action T1 and R are ergodic, and this is, uh, if that's the case, then on the right-hand side, I can further replace the group G1, G2, G4, and G6 by the, uh, by the whole group G, uh, G square. And uh, if that is the case, then uh, we would have the good for, um, uh, good for seminal estimate condition that we are looking for. And uh, what about the transformation T1 and uh, are they ergodic? And the answer is yes, uh, because the ergodicity of the transformation R, this is exactly given by the red condition there, because the red condition would imply TIT gen inverse is ergodic. And the ergodicity uh, um, uh, assumption on T1, this is hidden implicitly in the blue condition, because if you project to the first condition, uh, a first coordinate, you will see that uh, T1 is ergodic. So basically, in conclusion, we have that we indeed have the good for seminal. Uh, estimate uh, condition. So putting everything together, we have that the tuple T1 square and the T2 square is uh, jointly ergodic for the system. So uh, I hope that this uh, example tells um, uh, explains that the difference between the polynomial case and the, the linear case and how the concatenation theorem is very useful here. Uh, in the last two minutes, uh, uh, maybe I can um, uh, um, mention uh, an additional difficulty for the general joint logisticity conjecture. So think about the question where, consider we have, uh, again, a, a pair, which is T1 and T2, but instead of having N squared, that's, we have N cubed. So what, what can we do in this case? So um, even though the Van der Kolb trick tells us that we can always reduce a polynomial pattern into a linear one, but the amount of computation is enormous. And uh, if you pass from N2 to N squared, you will increase the, the, um, the amount of computation uh, significantly, and uh, it will be almost impossible to write down an expression. But as we discussed before, if we want to use the concatenation theorem, we have to first compute explicitly the subgroups SH1 to SH7, right? In order to talk about their sums. So in the general case, um, these groups SH1 to SH7 will, will be very difficult to compute, right? So in this case, how should we uh, apply this concatenation result and the van der Kolbe? So the solution to this is that uh, we do not, uh, we are unable to compute them explicitly. So we invent some method called the coefficient tracking method. So this is a method that enables us to, instead of computing the Van der Kolb trick step by step, um, I'm going to rec uh, record some information on the coefficients of the polynomials on the each step. And then that information, even though it don't give me the full uh, description of the computation, but uh, it, 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 it is, some, um, it is uh, some information which is sufficient for us to deduce a good seminal uh, estimate. So this is actually another di uh, difference between the Van der Kolbe for single transformation and for commuting transformation. For single transformation, you just do the pet induction. You don't care about the coefficients of the polynomial because in the end, you will always get a linear uh, uh, iterate. 
But for community transformations, um, because we have to use the continuation theorem at the end of the day, which is, rely, uh, which is uh, relevant to the coefficients. So we have to be uh, very careful, careful about the coefficients when we are doing the, uh, the induction. So this is why that we have to keep track of the coefficients. Okay, that is all that I have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yes, yeah. so it's like in one of our previous uh, version, so what we are doing is that we are not using the Franz Ignatius criterion. So basically what we do is like, for example, if I have a corollary like this, uh, uh, the last line, then I can decompose F into two parts, the structure and the random part. So the, the, for the structure part, I can assume the system is a new potent system. So then what we are going to do is that it's sufficient to prove joint logodicity for new potent systems. But then it turns out that there is a very subtle uh, uh, thing uh, on, on talking about accurate distribution for uh, new potent uh, 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 cases. It's like, if the group G is connected, then I think everything works well. But if G is not connected, there are some additional issues you need to overcome. So this, but so, 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 so uh, to sum up, that means there are still some obstacles if you want to do the new potent case. And what we are doing here is that instead of, instead of working actually on the new potent case, we use the criterion of Franz Ignatius, which tells you that, uh, which tells you that if you are working for joint logodicity problems, you don't have to think about new new potent case. You can reduce everything directly to the rotation case. But for the rotation case, everything is much easier. Uh, this is also a mystery to me too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it is a very nice result. But I think um, uh, using uh, some uh, ideas from analysis, but 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 but, uh, but somehow that uh, he's ma he's uh, managed to reduce to the rotation rotation case without actually using any uh, structures for the new potent uh, or, or theorems uh, re regarding to new uh, new potent uh, systems.